The Subcommittee on Space and Science will come to order. Uh, this is our third uh, meeting this Congress with this subcommittee. Uh, today we're going to examine, the, uh, examine NASA's management of key programs critical to mission success and NASA's partnerships with the commercial aerospace sector. Um, I'm confident this, today's discussion will be out of this world. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, NASA plays a key role in fulfilling the National Space Council's recent United States Space prior Priorities Framework, such as maintaining a robust U.S. space enterprise and preserving the space environment for missions focused on exploration to the moon and to Mars, uh, not to mention combating climate change with Earth science. Uh, We'll have strong, well, you need strong program management and the establishment of clear goals, uh, which are all fundamental to continue our nation's success in space. I'd like to express my appreciation for recommendations in the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel's latest report for NASA to designate an Artemis program manager with responsibility and accountability for all aspects of the Artemis mission, and to develop a 20-year strategic vision for future space exploration and operations, and to establish an internal management board with NASA center directors to align the activities of various NASA centers with agency priorities. I think we can say, uh, the Olympics notwithstanding, the world's eyes are once again upon the United States as we return to the moon and explore the next frontier. We're excited that this mission will also land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. While we prepare our return to the moon, we must also plan for our long-term future in low Earth orbit. That includes, of course, moving beyond the International Space Station. Recent International Space Station, the recent International Space Station transition report <clears throat> describes NASA's plans to retire the world's longest running spacecraft outlines, within it, is out, it outlines the costs from, maintain, uh, from ongoing maintenance of the International Space Station for, to replace aging, uh, aging parts, uh, the cost of cargo transport for needed supplies on board, uh, potential budget savings in transitioning to commercial stations. Uh, the report also evaluates the benefits and potential risks with commercial stations in low Earth orbit, and it discusses it discusses plans to deorbit the station into Earth's ocean. In previous subcommittee hearings, we have discussed the need for a bicameral NASA authorization bill. We'll discuss that again today. NASA hasn't been authorized by Congress since 2017. Authorization gives federal agencies clear congressional guidance. We look forward to working with my colleagues in the House of Representatives to send President Biden a NASA bill this Congress. Here, here. <laughs> this, this hearing will provide the subcommittee important oversight on NASA's current and future plans. We look forward to identifying how NASA and this committee can continue to collaborate on solutions to many of these pressing challenges. Our subcommittee's oversight is not limited to exploration programs alone, NASA has a huge role in Earth science to fight climate change, uh, in the incentives and technical expertise to address orbital debris crisis, what I call space trash. I'd also like to quickly highlight just a few of the many Colorado space industries contributions to NASA's success, just so I can return safely to Colorado. Uh, Lockheed Martin's selected to build the Mars Ascent Vehicle, uh, and return historic samples collected from Mars. Ball Aerospace Corporation built the mirror system for James Webb Space Telescope and Advanced Space. It's a, a small business in Colorado, uh, but it's a big part of NASA's capstone mission, launching spacecraft pathfinders for the Artemis program. We need to also recognize NASA's work with countless universities, small businesses, and entrepreneurs across the nation. It truly takes a large, talented team working together to succeed. I'd like to welcome today's witness panel, uh, Mr. James Free, Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, 
Mr. James Reuter, Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen, Associate Administrator, NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Mr. William Russell, Director of Government Accountability Office for Contracting and National Security Acquisitions Team. And Dr. Scott Pace, Director, Space Policy Institute at George Washington University, uh, former Executive Secretary of the National Space Council. Uh, I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Ranking Member Lummis, uh, Senator Lummis from Wyoming. Uh, I'm going to sneak off and vote, but then I get, if I don't get back in time, she will recognize Chairwoman Cantwell and then uh, Ranking Member Wicker, but I'll get back as quick as I can. Ranking Member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm very pleased that you're here today. Witnesses, welcome, and thank you so much for coming. Um, we have an excellent panel here today for a robust discussion about how we can work together to improve NASA's use of public-private partnerships. Working with the private sector has proven to be an important part of NASA's successes. But I'm concerned about NASA's history of cost growth and schedule slippage. Uh, that will become more important to address as we continue on in space exploration projects like Artemis. The launch of the James Webb Space Telescope on Christmas Day is an excellent example. I want to congratulate everyone who was involved in the project in NASA and beyond. It was an incredible accomplishment and a very complex project. Now, understanding that this was an expensive and complicated project, the cost expansion and the time slippage is nevertheless an issue, especially when put in the context of NASA's future projects, which will only grow in cost and complexity. The James Webb Space Telescope was originally estimated to launch in 2010 and cost $1.6 billion. It launched at the end of 2021 at a cost of $10 billion. Congress has reviewed and commented on cost and time slippages extensively, so I won't repeat my predecessor's work. But we have to learn from the James Webb experience to ensure it doesn't happen again. Already we're seeing delays in the Artemis program. NASA's Inspector General has said that NASA will likely exceed the 2024 target by several years. Understandably, cost and time overruns have caused NASA to deprioritize other projects. But I'm concerned that consistent deprioritization will cause vital projects to never make it off the ground. NASA is entrusted with billions of taxpayer dollars and must be a good steward of those dollars. Uh, with those opening remarks, um, I would like to recognize uh, Committee Chair Cantwell uh, for any opening remarks she may have. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Lamas, and thank you so much for you and uh, Chair Hickenlooper holding this important hearing. I, I want to say a thanks to um, you and the efforts of the committee to get these witnesses in front of us and uh, thank my colleague, Senator Wicker, for his uh, work that we did in including a NASA authorization as part of the uh, America's Competes Act or as we passed it out of the Senate, the U.S. Uh, Innovation and Competition Act. And so we're here today to talk about NASA and its future. Uh, I'm like many other members of this committee. You start off with how involved your state is in space, and Washington State is no exception. We have been involved in everything from Boeing's responsibility for the International Space Station to the Space Launch System, both SpaceX and Blue Origin being in the states of Washington, Rocket Don, um, many other companies who have been part of the space operations uh, for a long time now and uh, organizations like Rocketdyne and many others. Uh, and I always say there's a reason why we have something called the Space Needle. We're just very interested in space in the Northwest. But we're at a point where Na NASA is expanding the use of these more commercially oriented agreements for human exploration for scientific discovery. And last year, NASA awarded over 400 million to three companies to develop a commercial replacement to the International Space Station. These issues 
um, are very important to us, and in my opinion, uh, part of our competitiveness issues because of the leading role that NASA plays in helping us keep our leading role in aviation. That is in aviation competitiveness as it relates to next generation aircraft. Uh, frankly, our competitiveness as it relates to LEOs and uh, our satellite systems and in the future of space, space safety and, and other issues related to national security. So to me, uh, we're at a point where we need to get a, uh, authorization of NASA so that we can continue to do our job. And we need to do that as part of the conference that we are going to be working on, Senator Wicker and I. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, the General Accounting Office, and NASA's Office of Inspector General have highlighted issues related to NASA's management and oversight of missions, and that's why I think it's so important to have an authorizing bill. If this is such a critical mission for our country, if this is such a critical competitiveness issue, we can't wait five years for an authorization. We need the authorization, and our committee needs to continue to do our oversight role. That oversight role is on both traditional acquisitions and more commercial partnerships, programs like James Webb Telescope, which NASA successfully deployed last year, um, have issues of cost overrun and schedule, and GAO first designated NASA's management as a high risk area in 1990 due to its history of present cost and growth schedule slippage in a majority of its largest systems. Both ASAP and NASA Inspector General have critiqued NASA's lack of comprehensive and accurate cost estimates that accounts for all of Artemis programs. And the ASAP and GAO in particular have called for improved top level management of Artemis and greater transparency on cost schedule and decision making process. So the purpose of this hearing is to examine what are those best practices for the management of that system. The message must be clear regardless of the type of private uh, sector partnership when it comes to maximizing safety, manage, managing risk, and minimizing cost and schedule growth, the execution of the national vision for space ex exploration, the buck stops with NASA. And so we have to figure out the way we're going to play our oversight role. Hard to play an oversight role without getting an authorization and making sure that our goals are set in that authorization. So obviously NASA is ultimately accountable for those SESA operations and technical excellence and delivering for its customers. And the amount of transformation that is continuing to happen, we learned very much from the 737 MAX issues that system failures within the FAA's oversight caused us challenges, and we're now getting into this area of where we're really going to start thinking about commercial uh, exploration. So we're excited about NASA's future. We're excited about the mission. We're excited about our competitiveness as a nation in this particular very important area of the US economy. But we need to get an authorization bill, and we need to have frequent authorizations at least every five years approved by Congress. This notion of going through the Appropriations Committee without the mission, the commitment, the foresight, I would say to you, is also why we haven't been able to always get the budget we want to see, because we haven't got everybody on board on the importance of this mission. Trust me, when you look at the overall budget for NASA, the numbers are not that great compared to all of the other things that we're doing in the federal government. When you look at the investment that we're making on those issues that I just mentioned, aviation excellence, securing our future, the LEO and communication system, I guarantee you it's worth the investment. So let's figure out how we get this leadership to move forward and look forward to hearing from the panels today and having a chance to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I now recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Wicker. Thank you very much. I don't know exactly who has the gavel, but I have a, um, a statement that I would like unanimous consent to enter into the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. And I will simply add uh, that it, it is not always that the chair and the ranking member of the full committee attend um, subcommittee hearings. We are both here um, and strongly making the statement that we need a NASA reauthorization bill. We worked shoulder to shoulder very hard to get that put in the USICA bill. It was regrettably omitted in the House, 
but I have every confidence that we'll be able to get the NASA reauthorization bill in the USICA bill uh, passed by the House and Senate and sent on for the signature of President Biden, and I yield my time. Thank you, Ranking Member. I would like to now recognize each witness for their opening statement. Uh, we will begin with uh, Mr. James Free, Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate. Mr. Free, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Cantwell, uh, Ranking Member Alumnus, members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss America's next great exploration initiative, the Artemis Program. Our, effort, our efforts to promote the commercial development of low Earth orbit and the partnerships that are so important in those efforts. It's thrilling to stand in the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center and see this rocket and spacecraft transformed from legislation to real hardware, about to embark upon its first voyage to the moon. Soon the entire vehicle will be rolled out to the pad for the wet dress rehearsal in preparation for the Artemis I mission. This is the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will demonstrate the nation's commitment and capability to extend human presence to the moon and beyond. To be clear, NASA's long-term goal is to send humans to Mars, and we will use the moon to help us get there. Following this year's uncrewed Artemis I flight test, NASA will conduct Artemis II, a crewed flight test around the moon in the spring of 2024. After these flights, NASA will launch Artemis III, which will return U.S. astronauts to the surface of the moon sometime in 2025 or soon thereafter. NASA is also developing the Gateway, a lunar outpost post that will serve as an orbital platform supporting future human and robotic missions to science and resource-rich areas of the lunar surface. The Gateway is also a demonstration of NASA's commitment to international cooperation in the Artemis program, extending our international partnerships that we have today from low Earth orbit. NASA has also begun to work with commercial space industry to obtain new spacesuits. Under this new program, NASA will continue to leverage its expertise on spacewalk systems, spacesuits, and operational concepts. Building upon the work done during Apollo, as well as recent and future robotic lunar missions, NASA intends to make this exploration effort a sustainable one with the help of new technologies, as well as innovative commercial and international partnerships, all while advancing principles for peaceful and sus sustainable space exploration through the Artemis Accords. In encouraging commercial low Earth orbit development, NASA has invested in the development of commercial space transportation and today purchases services from U.S. companies for the resupply of the International Space Station and for crew transportation services. We are now laying the groundwork for future commercial space stations through the Commercial LEO Destination, or CLDs, program. And it's NASA's goal to be one of the many customers of commercial LEO Destination services. There are already over 20 commercial facilities operating aboard ISS today. And Station is now entering into an era of robust commercial use as we prepare the way for the commercial LEO destinations. In order to prevent a gap in U.S. presence in LEO, the administration extended use of the ISS through 2030 to ensure the commercial LEO destinations are online before retirement of the ISS. It is NASA's goal to continue international partnerships in LEO beyond the life of ISS. We intend to ensure continued collaboration with international partners on a U.S. commercial LEO destination through government to government, government to industry, and or industry to industry arrangements. Every bit of work that I've mentioned is possible because of the people of NASA and our private sector partners. Our people have del delivered despite COVID, which includes losing some of their teammates because of the virus. They have come to work while their houses were damaged and without power due, due to severe storms. They have come with the spirit of exploration that has and will always be as tangible as the hardware. I'm grateful to be able to represent them here. Thank you for the first of what I hope are numerous interactions to help explain our plans, how we can continue to work together 
and most importantly, share our progress taking humanity farther into the solar system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Free. Um, I'll now recognize Mr. James Reiter, Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. Mr. Reiter, you are recognized. All right, and, th and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Loomis. Thank you, Chairwoman Cantwell. And thank you for the entire subcommittee and your support staff. I appreciate being invited here to talk. Um, I'm Jim Reuter, the Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. STMD develops transformative technologies that enable NASA's future missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond, while ensuring our technology investments will support the space economy. I'd like to start by sharing an example of a technology infusion story that shows our impact. Uh, in 2009, the small business deployable space systems had an innovative idea for a rollout solar array. The technology that we know today as ROSA promised to be smaller, lighter, and less expensive than conventional solar panels. Multiple STMD funding opportunities, including 19 SBIR awards that they won, followed by a ground demonstration, allowed the company to establish technical and commercial merit. Today, that innovation benefits human exploration and science missions. Last summer, astronauts installed two ROSAs on the International Space Station to, to replace the aging solar panels there. Once all six are installed, they will provide up to 30% more power for station research and operations. NASA's double asteroid redirection test is the first planetary spacecraft to fly the new arrays, and the gateway power and propulsion element will also use two roses. This example, I think, shows how technology drives exploration. Today, STMD has more than 1,400 technology projects and approximately 140 planned flight demonstrations. Partnerships are a common thread throughout our portfolio. In the coming months, we will send the Capstone CubeSat to the moon as a pathfinder for the Artemis program. Capstone, which is led by Advanced Space in Colorado, uh, will collect data and test navigation technologies in the unique orbit plan for Gateway. Capstone has already developed and matured several commercial capabilities spinning off of, of this innovation with us. Our laser communications relay demonstration was launched in December to prove the viability of two-way optical communications between spacecraft and the ground. Laser communications will enable missions to transmit 10 to 100 times more data in a single download. The upcoming Deep Space Optical Communications demonstration that will be launched later this year as part of, of Thomas's Psyche mission will further demonstrate optical communications from deep space, helping the aerospace community standardize the technology for future implementation. This year, we're looking forward to the Bernard Cutter Lofted Technology Demonstration. This is a partnership with ULA that will test an inflatable heat shield. After launch, it will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and we'll learn how the design slows down and survives conditions relevant to many potential applications. Uh, we could use it uh, to land humans on Mars, while launch providers could also use the technology to recover rocket parts after launch, thereby reducing the overall cost of access to space. Uh, STMD's technology investments, including those related to Artemis, are cross-cutting. Technology development efforts under our Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative are vital for a robust lunar presence by NASA and industry. Our Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, which we formed actually just before the COVID pandemic hit, um, now includes participation from over 600 organizations from all 50 states, engaging a broad community across all our sectors to help inform our technology development plans. As STMD prepares Necessary capabilities for later lunar missions will also use the moon as a technology testbed for Mars. In collaboration with the Department of Energy and private industry, NASA is pursuing design concepts for a nuclear fission surface power system that will provide safe, reliable, and continuous power on other worlds. In the near term, we'll use the commercial lunar landers, part of Thomas's program, to demonstrate capabilities related to in situ resource utilization, communications, surface power and mobility, and more. While some are NASA developed, others are commercial payloads that have received our support via our, our Tipping Point public-private partnerships. Through our Tipping Point and announcement of collaboration opportunities, STMD makes joint investments with industry on important capabilities. We're going to release the next call very soon, this month. The sele selected Tipping Points were awarded as, for the first time as funded Space Act agreements to greatly streamline our partnerships and be responsive to the commercial community. 
And in closing, I'd like to give a plug to our interactive novel, which is called First Woman. Um, it's a STEM product that showcases our NASA lunar plans with a focus on reaching school-age children. So it's, it's a really a great book, I think. Um, we, this has been downloaded over one million times over the last few months um, and over with 70 countries, and we get tremendous response from it. Um, I'm excited about the tremendous results we're achieving with our sustained investments in technology, and I thank you for your continued investment in our future. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. I look forward to seeing the book. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Thomas uh, Zerbuchen, Associate Administrator, NASA Science Mission Directorate. Dr. Thank, Buchen. Thank you, Ranking Member okay. Lamas and uh, Chairwoman Cantwell. Thanks for inviting me here and to talk about partnership uh, with our U.S. commercial partners and also about accountability and oversight, both topics that are really important to us. I have the honor of leading the world's best science program in and from space, and I have every intent to keep it the best program anywhere, uh, you know, uh, really setting the pace of exploration for the entire world when it comes to science. Before I talk about ongoing collaborations, let me address the core belief that our commercial sector, including early stage entrepreneurial companies, are a key differentiator between us and others who seek to catch up with us or worse. Public-private partnerships enable us to undertake great challenges and to do things uh, or do things at a better value that otherwise would be possible if we just focused on us alone and that create, create excitement for an engaged U.S. workforce in ways that otherwise just really isn't possible. SMD has worked hard, therefore, to engage with commercial partners, uh, large and small, and to learn about new ways to bring our enterprise forward. In doing so, continually learning about what works, and frankly, also, what doesn't work, focusing towards enhanced science and science per dollar in all of our enterprises. I want to just give you a few examples about this. The Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLIPS, as we I refer to it, is leveraging entrepreneurial small co space companies' capabilities to deliver NASA payloads quickly and affordably to the surface of the moon. We ask these companies to move quickly to demonstrate the capability uh, to do science uh, as NASA pursues uh, a NASA-wide uh, Moon to Mars program. Uh, we pretty soon will see how well it works because we, in the next 12 months, we expect three landers uh, to be on the surface of the moon. And I want to tell you, uh, these uh, landers are built by teams from Pennsylvania to Texas and all the way to California, uh, often by players that have not been in the business with us. And I want to also tell you, of course, they will do so at higher risk, but I want to remind everybody that will do so at three to five times lower the cost than it would be if we build it ourselves with traditional means. Focusing on our most beautiful planet, our Earth, uh, we of course have the work of the Earth Science uh, Division uh, that directly benefits Americans, uh, you know, helping to make farmers better prepared in response to challenging times, uh, uh, whether it's severe weather or just the trends overall related to our changing climate. Uh, and also beyond the U.S., really supporting uh, fisheries and others uh, around the world. That work is supported directly with partners like Google and uh, Microsoft and, and uh, also has enhanced increasingly uh, by, is enhanced increasingly by data available by commercial companies that image the Earth from space. We have three of those companies on contract, uh, Planet, Spire Global, and Maxar. Uh, two more in an evaluation phase, and four right behind them. This is really a flow towards that. When we started with that, the question was, will the scientists use it? And I have to tell you, because of AI and ML new technologies, the data are used beyond our expectations. Over 1,500 science users and universities around uh, the United States and beyond using these very data now, making them being made available by our uh, innovative contracting. If you look at uh, 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 the last 30 missions done by NASA Science and compare their total development cost that we decided it would be a predicted at confirmation, and we, we look at the over, we look at how much it actually cost in science, we have an overrun of my, an underrun of minus 2.2 percent. So overall, in total, we, the missions cost less. 
than uh, they did before. If we look at web and we basically take the confirmation that was done with the right uh, to tools uh, that uh, was established, uh, that number will switch to plus 3.8%. So that's where we are today. That's not good enough for us. Uh, we agree with everything that was said. Uh, we need to continue to, con to learn about how to do better and to learn from this. I just want to tell you that these numbers that I just quoted to you would be very hard to imagine if it wasn't for the James Webb Space Telescope, where frankly, we had really hard lessons that we have implemented and so many of our uh, lessons uh, learned and how we manage today. We just recently did a, a large mission study where we look again at everything we can learn from the recent Mars mission that landed just uh, 12 months ago on the surface of Mars and from Webb, and we have implemented new recommendations that we're feeding again into how we're managing our missions. That includes independent reviews. It includes program offices that report to me directly and get the attention and also uh, bring solutions to bear and many more for us to do better uh, as we go forward and really bring that excitement uh, forward uh, that uh, really is at the heart of everything we do here. Thank you so much. Mr. Russell. Chair Hickenlooper, uh, Ranking Member Loomis, Chair Cantwell, thanks for the opportunity to be here today to discuss NASA accountability and oversight, as well as efforts to leverage the commercial sector to accomplish agency's goals. NASA's major acquisition projects are key enablers for the agency to achieve its important mission. These projects will allow NASA to continue exploring the solar system, extending human presence to the lunar surface and beyond, uh, and better understanding climate change, among other things. The projects are complex, specialized, and often push the state of the art in space technology. As a result, NASA's acquisition portfolio will always have inherent technical design and integration risks to manage. Acquisition management has been a long-standing challenge at NASA and has been on our high, list, high risk list for many decades due to persistent cost growth and schedule slips in the majority of its major systems. NASA has taken steps to improve its management of major projects, including implementing a corrective action plan, but still more needs to be done to reduce acquisition risk and demonstrate progress, especially with regard to its new projects. In terms of public partner, private par partnerships, since 2005, NASA has expanded its efforts to work with commercial companies, especially with commercial crew, commercial uh, program, Commercial Cargo Program Office to encourage the growth of private spaceflight sector. The Commercial Crew Program has had success, including SpaceX's completion of three crewed missions to the International Space Station. NASA has continued to build on this experiment to support the Artemis missions. For example, the Human Landing System Program is using commercial partnerships to develop and jointly develop and deploy a landing system to transport astronauts to and from the lunar surface. In addition, under the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, NASA plans to have companies deliver payloads directly to the moon. As NASA works to execute Artemis and other missions, I'd like to highlight several opportunities identified from our reviews of NASA's major projects to strengthen oversight and accountability. First, NASA can better manage cost and schedule performance for its largest projects. While cost and schedule growth can occur on any project, increases associated with NASA's most costly and complex missions can have cascading effects on the rest of the acquisition portfolio. For example, billions of dollars in James Webb cost growth had reverberating effects on the rest of the NASA portfolio, including the proposed ca cancellation of other uh, programs. NASA will have new opportunities with the SLS Block 1B and other systems to demonstrate that they're better managing costs. Second, NASA can minimize risk and programmatic decisions to better position their programs for successful execution. NASA leadership has at times approved decisions that compound technical challenges. For example, in May 2021, we found that NASA's planned pace to develop the human landing system was months faster than other spaceflight programs, even though a lander is inherently more complex. Initial HLS contractor proposals we reviewed also include technologies with relatively low maturity levels, which can require additional time to develop. Third, 
NASA can work to improve transparency into costs for its long-term plans. For example, SLS costs are not captured beyond Artemis I, and Orion crew capsule costs are not currently captured beyond Artemis II. To help increase cost transparency in December 2019, we recommended that NASA create an Artemis III mission cost estimate to help NASA effectively monitor total mission costs and to provide Congress with insight into program affordability when making decisions about each year's budget request. NASA concurred with this recommendation and they plan to release the estimate later this year. In summary, NASA continues to pursue ambitious goals through its portfolio of major projects as it expands its efforts to leverage resources between the public and private sectors. Using sound project management tools and implementing the recommendations that I've highlighted today could help better position future major projects for success. We look forward to continuing to work with NASA and the subcommittee to address these important issues. Chair Hickenlocher, uh, uh, ranking our chair Cantwell, this concludes my prepared statement. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Russell. All right, Dr. Pace. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Hickenlooper, uh, Senator Lummis, and Senator Cantwell, Senator Wicker, and uh, joining us here today. Uh, really, this is, I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss this important topic of NASA accountability and oversight with you today. I'd like to begin uh, by observing that the U.S. space enterprise not only is facing major challenges, but it's also in a better position than it was a decade ago after the rather difficult passage of the 2010 NASA Authorization Act. This has been made possible uh, by the bipartisan support of Congress, and American leadership in space continues to be a powerful symbol of our country at its best. And this committee is crucial uh, to that future leadership, so I, I really uh, applaud your support. Uh, in the most recent report of NASA's Aerospace Safety uh, Advisory Panel, the panel was critical of what it sees as, quote, disaggregated decentralized program structure between SLS, EGS, Orion, with the view that it is a manageable alternative to familiar and effective program framework that served it well for the Apollo, STS, and ISS programs, unquote. Uh, I believe the, the, uh, the ASAP makes a crucial observation, it's an important observation, uh, but I do not believe the choice is between doing nothing or uh, fully replicating earlier government industry conditions. As with commercial firms, NASA needs to make uh, build or buy decisions on what capabilities to perform in-house, what capabilities should be outsourced to others. The scale and scope of NASA missions combined with its relatively small budget means that build or buy decisions represent major strategic choices for the agency. The commercial sector is a key strategic advantage for the United States, as we know, and by exploiting the scale and scope of private sector activities, the United States can outpace competitors and adversaries. I believe an immediate priority for the agency should be an architecture study and campaign plan encompassing NASA activities from low Earth orbit out to the lunar surface for at least the next 10, 15 years. Uh, when Mike Griffin became administrator and I went to work for him, one of his first actions was an exploration systems architecture study to determine how we would go from completing the ISS, ending the shuttle program, landing humans on the moon, building a capability to go to Mars. Now, one can argue about the content that became the Constellation program, but we had a detailed understanding of performance requirements, technical risks, costs, and schedule drivers. I am not suggesting a return to the Constellation architecture, which was optimized for a particular time and place. I am, however, arguing for having that kind of detailed understanding and insight to make sound decisions about where NASA will exercise direct oversight and where it will rely on others. For example, the HLS is being developed as a public-private partnership, a decision I supported while in government and a decision I support today. However, it was disappointing there was insufficient funds for two awards. ISS experiences such as the Columbia accident, reliance on Russian launchers, development of commercial cargo and crew capabilities, all have driven home the value of dissimilar redundancy to the agency. Having such redundancy is even worth paying a premium for, as opposed to relying on a single supplier. In practical terms, however, NASA cannot pay an arbitrarily high premium, and so the search for a second SLS source, HLS source, cannot be found, if it cannot be found by market competition, the agency will need to consider using more traditional contracting. Uh, I think the point here is there should be opportunities in the future for finding another on-ramp uh, without slowing down the current HLS effort, which I think does need to proceed uh, expeditiously. 
In managing acquisitions, there is nothing in current law that necessitates slow and rigid acquisition decision making. Barriers arise because of culture and management practices, often in response to historical problems, not the law itself. If there's not a sense of urgency and regular real world feedback in the service of national objectives, the natural tendency of organizations is to prioritize their own internal incentives. In terms of people, NASA has not been able to fully capture, grow, and retain the people with the necessary skills to manage complex multi-partner programs. This is one of the greatest risks facing NASA. Competency and confidence in leaders can only partly be taught. It is most effectively grown through experiences, particularly in flight test and with real missions. The space science community and commercial communities have been able to do this through a regular cadence of development programs. Human spaceflight needs similar opportunities. Uh, the Associate Administrator for Exploration and System Development here with us today should be accountable for exercising overall our architecture development and implementation. And this in turn requires an integration function at his level for developing requirements and ensuring alignment of program requirements and verification. Technical authority should not be delegated to the centers as this introduces a layer of bureaucracy costing both time and money. Uh, the buck stops at NASA headquarters. Um, and with that, I look forward to the discussion and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Case. Uh, now we'll begin uh, the exciting part of the panel, asking questions. Um, first, uh, Mr. Royer, let me talk, start with you. Uh, this committee spent a, has spent a significant amount of time on the issues around orbital debris. Uh, it's been one of our legislative priorities. Uh, NASA's ex Inspector General recently stated <clears throat> that the agency should, and I quote, lead collaborative efforts to mitigate orbital debris, including activities to encourage active debris removal, uh, and quote, invest in methods and technologies for removing uh, defunct spacecraft. Uh, there are a number of companies, such as Astroscale, which is in Colorado, that are already working with Europeans, the Japanese, and other countries on debris re removal demonstrations. Uh, how would you describe NASA's current capability to support technology maturity for a US-led active debris removal prize or, or some other form of demonstration project? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I fully agree that this is a critical issue that we need to be addressing. Um, what I'd like to do is, is think in terms of having an overall uh, orbital debris control plan. And in that plan, I picture it as being three pillars. The first pillar being uh, detection and tracking of small orbital debris that's too small to track currently, but still hazardous to us. The second pillar would be mitigation of oral debris by, and, and that's reduce the amount of, of debris that's, that's generated by design, operational controls, and disposal. And then finally, the third one is the actual, uh, the, the subject that you asked about of active debris removal. I picture all three of these areas needing, uh, needing investment in order for us to go forward. And the one that's most, by far, easily the most technologically challenging is the removal, of the active debris removal. Uh, the challenge that we have there is, is there's many technologies, uh, there's, the challenge we have on active debris removal is primarily one of you have a tumbling out of control uh, debris that you have to try to capture and, and or just move those and safe, safe as it goes along. That's not take capability that we have today. We have capability to do that if it's in, in control, but not if in that circumstance. So that's an extremely challenging thing. And on top of that, this is we need to be careful of how we address this because, uh, because what we have is, is the very real potential to do more harm than good right. if we're not careful about this. So we need to be measured about we, how we invest in this, but, but, um, you know, but it is a very real concern. There's a lot of areas that are common core technologies that we have a lot of work going done on that's going to be needed for, for an active debris removal. Things like, and especially with regard to satellite servicing. There's very many of them are very similar to each other. So we need proximity, proximity operations, sensors and instrumentation, efficient propulsion, a guidance and navigation, autonomous operations of robotics, and propellant refueling in cases. So those are things that we have well underway, but it is that critical next step of, 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 act, of, of the being able to capture and save a, a tumbling object out of control. That we Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Free, um, 
I'm one of the believers that Artemis is going to inspire the world. Um, again, putting the first woman, the first person of color on the moon. Uh, Nicole Ayers of Colorado just started training in NASA's uh, 2020, 2022 astronaut class. Um, does NASA have an updated projection of the, of the next lunar landing, and how is NASA planning for redundancy and creating competition in critical parts of the Artemis program? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. And I actually met Nicole at the uh, oh. at the ceremony. So uh, quite an impressive group uh, of of people. So update on our plans for uh, return to the lunar surface. Um, as you know, Artemis One uh, right now is uh, I mentioned in the vehicle assembly building. Um, we hope to uh, roll out in in March. We have a critical test when we get to the pad. Um, that will really set our launch date. And Artemis One has a strong tie to Artemis Two, which is our first crewed mission um, uh, going back around the moon. And uh, right now, that is in 2024, Artemis Two is, and we hope that uh, Artemis Three return will be in 2025. That's our, our current plan. Uh, we're learning as we go. If, if we had uh, the ultimate... Uh, uh, path. That's why this is a test demonstration. We would be putting crew on this first mission, but our goal is to learn as we go. Um, and 2025 is our current prediction. With respect to redundancy, um, many of our systems throughout the years have been single redundant when you take them at the vehicle level. But below that, our subsystems have multiple levels of redundancy, <clears throat> be it fail safe or completely uh, uh, Dissimilar redundancy is the term we use that have a completely different path to get uh, the redundancy we need to operate the vehicle. So from our perspective, it's we're on a good path and we have the redundancy that we think we need within the individual vehicles to protect the crew and the mission. Great. Perfect. Um, I don't see a republic. I'm out of time, but it doesn't mean I don't have other questions, so there, there will be time to come. Um, but I'll turn it over to uh, Chair Cantwell for now. Thank you, Senator Hickenlooper, and I thank you while you were gone for holding this important hearing and for your very keen interest in the subject, and I thank all the witnesses for uh, their testimony. I think it was enlightening and helpful uh, for the discussion uh, that, that we're trying to have. I wanted to start just with a general question. Do you think that an authorization bill is the best way for Congress to keep oversight over NASA and NASA's mission? Is that the best tool that, that we have? I, 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 I'll speak first and let any of my colleagues speak. I think the authorization bill is something we, we definitely would like to continue to work together on and, and that we see a lot of uh, alignment with our, our mission in the authorization. Yeah, and, and I'll say that uh, we're very interested in working with you and your committee and in and, and whichever way that you end up determining that you can best go forward and recognizing the constraints you're under. Uh, but we fully recognize your role and look forward to it as, as an oversight. I think uh, over time, these bills have been very effective in setting policy and bringing us forward uh, in the time of change that we're in. It's certainly one of... Uh, a very effective tool, one of several that uh, really could be uh, tremendously uh, important and impactful for all of us. Mr. Russell? No, absolutely. Authorization language helps give the agency direction. You know, it's something that we see across the Congress, whether it's the National Defense Authorization Act, other agencies. So, yes. Dr. Pace? You know, there is a, there's a story in the rocket business. They asked the question what makes the rocket go up? Funding makes the rocket go up. What makes funding go up? Bipartisan support. The space business is in many ways a delicate operation. It's, it's something that can't be whipsawed uh, back and forth, or, and if you do, it's bad. So steady bipartisan support that evolves and is expressed through the authorization bill is one of the things that not only gives confidence, I think, to industry, it also gives confidence to our international partners that there is this steady hand and a steady direction it can vary, it can be cost differences and schedule differences, but the th strategic direction is steady, and that's an amazing advantage for the United States. So uh, I think the auth bill is one of the best ways to do that, but certainly you have plenty of other tools to get the agency's attention on other matters. But in terms of expressing it, I think the auth bill has been very, very, very helpful, and I, I hope you well, succeed. You're, you're bringing up a lot of issues there, Dr. Pace, in that statement. I mean. I don't believe we're just check writers, nothing against my colleagues on appropriations, but 
I, I think you hit on a key thing here, that the mission and the buy-in to the mission and the oversight of the mission. Mr. Russell, do you have other responsibilities or just NASA? No, I work on uh, defense cybersecurity, a lot of defense contracting issues as well. Okay, do you find these NASA issues ever changing in the con this context of the technology? I'm sorry? Do you find the technology aspect of this ever changing on NASA? Yes, certainly. Um, NASA is dealing with advanced technologies as well as the Department of Defense. I, I think, Dr. Pace, back to you. Your, your points about architecture, programming, risk, cost assessment, direct oversight, insufficient funds, dissimilar redundancy, another roadmap about another on-ramp, how to load that on, national objectives, is exactly what we're after. That's exactly what we're after. And so, Mr. Free, I think the concern here is we don't have... Um, uh, you know, we don't have the program manager, clear authority, responsibility, consistency on redundancy, then you don't get the funds, then you do something different. And, um, you know, we're doing our best here. Uh, we're doing our best here, but I think people got to come to terms with this model that is evolving, and I believe in it, in a public-private partnership. I do believe in it. But... I'm saying it takes a lot for us to have oversight. I, we just, the committee went through an unbelievable process in trying to correct what we thought was an overdelegation by the FAA to manufacturing. Now, you're not, we're not in the commercial space travel business yet. Okay, that day might, might come. So I'm not really referring to that aspect of, say, the FAA's authorities that has been boxed in so far about regulating that. I'm talking more just about the fact that we have an oversight role, a stewards of the taxpayer money, this mission, the objectives of this mission, the desire, as you said, Dr. Pace, on an international basis. And I just don't see how we get that without an authorization bill and management of these programs. And I don't think you get the management and the oversight of the programs if you don't have the authorizations and things clearly laid out. So. I think uh, we have a very changing technology environment. We have a new relationship. We don't have the authorizations, and we have don't have an Artemis. Is that right? We don't have an Artemis program manager with clear authority. Is that right, Mr. Free? Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. We, we, we do not have an Artemis program manager. Um, I can tell you we're, as you know, we're in the process of reorganizing now, and we are setting up a structure that has the accountability without that program manager name, but um, with, with the accountability for the missions um, and for the execution of those missions, both within my mission directorate and also the space operations mission directorate. But I think Dr. Dr. Pace is bringing up that we need all of these things. We need the program risk, the costs, the oversight of uh, the direction, questions about insufficient funds. We need. We need this to be robust and uh, not just at appropriations time. This needs to be a robust commitment. And so anyway, I don't know, Dr. Pace, what else do you think we should do? Well, I think, I think one of the things I would uh, point out uh, is that the system integration capabilities that NASA has, I think is fairly good within the separate projects. I'm standing from the outside looking at SLS, Orion, Exploration Ground, uh, ground Systems and Gateway. I think what you're bringing up is the issue of cross-enterprise integration. How does something that, uh, say, Thomas is doing in, in Science Mission Directorate, CLIPS program, how does that feed into Gateway program? How does that feed into the lunar surface? How does exploration activities uh, and things we're doing for exploration maybe feed back to what we do in low Earth orbit? So it's kind of having that broader architecture picture. Now, um, again, I don't want to repeat the past because it's, it's, it, the situation today is different. But when we began the Exploration Systems Architecture Study for Constellation, uh, we had a lot of people at headquarters and we brought big teams in to work this problem. Not to settle every question, but to make sure we had the intellectual capability there. During the Apollo program, uh, there was a thing called uh, Belcor where there was a system integration, integration capability for the Apollo program that used uh, federally funded research and development centers use some industry. It it built an intellectual function. So if you if you're going to on one hand decentralize things and having more private partnerships out there, there is a concurrent requirement for headquarters 
to actually know a lot more and be a lot more involved and be armed up a lot more and cannot delegate all of that out. So I'm absolutely a fan of public-private partnerships. I'm absolutely a fan of delegating it out, but actually there is a responsibility that then flows onto headquarters. And I think parts of the agency are doing fine, but I think it's that cross-enterprise integration that's still needed. Same issue we just dealt with. Same issue that we just dealt with with, with the FAA and oversight of aviation in general. And I would say, we've we're, we're in the last several years, we've transformed. <laughs> it's not just Congress do oversight of NASA. It's Congress do oversight of NASA as they partner with the private sector. And I think, uh, and the amount of acceleration, and I know my colleagues are here, so we're gonna let them ask questions, but I think we get a lot of frustration from people. And so when I ask, or people, we ask, well, what do you think's gonna happen when we land on the moon? What, where do you think that's, what's that gonna look like? I think some people think there's gonna be somebody at Johnson Control saying, yeah, this is what we're doing, we're landing on the moon. I think a bunch of other people think it's, you know, one of these billionaires and they're gonna be you know, in their corporate headquarters and they're going to be doing this work. And I think somewhere this image of what is uh, Americans' space exploration is, it's developing, let's just say that, it's just developing. But I think people wanna know what is NASA's role in that, what's our oversight role in that. I certainly don't wanna see us fail in our funding of a NASA mission here in Congress because some people think that we, uh, are incenting these other individuals and somehow the, that this is not a, a U.S. government-led mission for us to return to the moon. I don't think that's the impression they're getting lately. So, and, and I don't think that does us a great deal of service. We need to, as you said, not only lead for ourselves, but lead for the international efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, now we'll switch over to Senator Moran. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to visit with our witnesses today. Mr. Zuter, uh, Zerbert Zerbuchen, oh, I know how to pronounce your name except when it's uh, time for me to do so. Uh, it's good to see you again. Congratulations on your success, uh, the success of NASA and others in regard to the James Webb Telescope. I can remember the discussions in the appropriations process about should we pull the plug on this, this long time cost and expensive program, and I'm glad to see that we did not and uh, I'm glad to see the success. Would you comment on the importance that our aerospace industry played in order to make this mission a success and what Science Mission Direct Directorate learned over the course of Webb's development that will improve NASA's collaboration with the commercial space industry? I really appreciate your comments and uh, also your support and the support of your colleagues uh, of this uh, magnificent mission. and. Uh, uh, I know, I was sat there in the back of your office uh, uh, just having started my job and finding that we really were in trouble with that uh, telescope, unfortunately. And uh, so I appreciate the trust that you had uh, with it. Uh, it's very hard uh, for us to, uh, frankly impossible for us to uh, build a mission like uh, Webb without our commercial commercial partners. It's at Northrop Grumman at Ball Aerospace. Uh, it's uh, with contractors, frankly, in 42 states around the, the United States and, uh, and another 10 plus countries elsewhere that brought this uh, telescope together. Uh, our partnership has to be really deep and it's precisely that tension of really working with our partners, taking advantage of what they can do, but also deep oversight and insight that is something that we did a lot of learning on and I believe in the last few years of web. Uh, really uh, have been uh, exemplary. I, I've really seen a team come together. If you see them in the in the, uh, mission, in the control office there, and I hope uh, you and your colleagues can come visit them, you see a unified bachelor's team working together as one. Uh, from the science perspective, uh, it, it is kind of the next big, uh, you know, uh, transformational step, kind of we think at the same magnitude as a Hubble Space Telescope in terms of scientific impact. Will there be Nobel Prizes? I don't know, but it certainly has a chance to do so. And uh, you know, the integrative uh, function of that with tens of thousands of individuals, both within the United States, but also abroad, really looking at that telescope as seeing the most important and most significant telescope of our times is something that I believe reflects the US leadership we wanna reflect out of this agency. Uh, thank you again, and uh, I'm excited about the future as well. Uh, Dr. Free Artemis, uh, you're the third person to be at the helm of what now is the development of, of the Artemis program. 
There's a lot of progress, and we look forward to the launch of Artemis I mission that should be happening soon. In your first few months as the head of exploration, what changes have you made to ensure that Artemis will progress, uh, that the pro programmatic risks are well understood, and that all the pieces will be in place uh, for Artemis to be the role model for into the future? Thank you for the question, sir. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, the, the first was uh, not disturbing Artemis I. That's been my number one priority. I've, I've briefed that several times. The Artemis I team is, is on a good path. I've tried to come up to speed to understand where I could help. So that's the first thing I tried to do is not get in the way. Um, the, the second thing was to really understand where we are programmatically with all the elements that have to come together for the future Artemis missions. Um, the human landing system, as an example, is the, the next major element that has to come into the architecture. It's also where are we in the development of, of the Artemis II Orion capsule that's going to carry crew for the first time with some new systems. So I, I really wanted to make sure they understood where our programs were and got a handle on it. There's other elements that we examined as well for some of the outer uh, Artemis missions. And then it's, do we have a realistic plan with our funding profile to execute? That's the, I, I think I owe that to all of you and certainly the taxpayers and, and to the team to say, do we, do we know our, uh, our, our current status and where we're going? So to me, that's, that's been the priority. Uh, we, as you know, we've also reorganized. Um, so trying to make sure that we have an integrated path with Kathy Leaders and the Space Operations Mission Directorate, and we understand our roles and responsibilities going forward uh, to manage the risks that, that you referenced. Thank you. Dr. Pace, I had a question for you, but I'm out of time. But I, I want to use whatever 15 right. seconds I have left. Well, it would, may surprise you, and I hate to admit it, but I was looking at my email while you were testifying. And uh, this is uh, a, a, an aspect of NASA that means a very great deal to me. Uh, an article in a local newspaper, a science project designated by sixth and eighth grade students at Pawnee Heights School in Roselle will be a, aboard a Blue Origin rocket in about a year. Their project was one of 57 nationwide selected as winners in NASA's, in first NASA TechRise student challenge and they're receiving $1,500 for purposes of developing a coffee grinder that can work in zero gravity. Um, perhaps the coffee grinder is probably really important. I don't drink coffee, but to many people, this is a huge uh, component, perhaps, of space. But this is the future of our country, both in space, in defense, in economy. And NASA plays a significant, perhaps a financial role, but more importantly, a role model role in making sure that students in a place like Pawnee Heights, and what I have not told you is, there are 131 students K through 12 in Pawnee Heights. This is something that is life changing and changes our country. And you have a lot of responsibilities to help us make certain there's another generation that uh, can follow your lead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Moran. I can only imagine that the least of their problems would be figuring out how to collect all that ground coffee in a, mm. a, a a system without gravity. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, the first graduation speech I ever gave as a member of Congress was at Pawnee Heights. There were 11 uh, seniors, and uh, their student uh, trip, graduation trip, was to Bermuda. Like, I, man, I, wanna, I wish I'd have gone to school here. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I'll just say, since that's our, our program, we really appreciate that. And there's 56 other stories like that around of all, all the selections we made. It was a fantastic response. Thank you, Mr. Reverend. Exactly. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure that they have long forgotten the trip to Bermuda, but your words have stayed with them forever. <laughs> uh, grow up and be a scientist. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here, and more important, for the great work that NASA and uh, all of you are doing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the private sector and how it provides assistance to that work in Connecticut. We have a very robust manufacturing community which supports the space in industry as it does aerospace. In fact, uh, we call ourselves, I hope others do as well, the Aerospace Alley. This Monday, I visited with a company, Infinity Fuel Cell and Hydrogen in Windsor, and they are the recipients of one of NASA's tipping point 
contracts to develop power and energy and products that can be used in lunar and other space applications. Enormously exciting because it provides the opportunity to have fuel cell power, which for all the reasons you well know is potentially extremely important. We can't put, or we don't want to do it anyway, nuclear power on those space objects that we send into space. But um, this application is, is potentially groundbreaking or uh, space breaking. Skyer of East Hartford was also awarded a contract for developing um, a cyrogenic propellant system. Um, and these stories, along with a lot of others in Connecticut, these are, by the way, small businesses, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 people, uh, comparable to our defense industrial sector, doing great work. And they highlight the benefits of NASA's public-private partnerships. Um, Mr. Reuter, as you noted in your testimony, the Space Technology Mission Directorate is utilizing industry-developed technologies. And I'm excited that these two Connecticut companies are part of those partnerships. How can we in Congress best, best support the STMD to ensure that companies like Infinity and Sire continue the great work that they're doing? And what can we do in particularly to support those two companies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator. We really appreciate it. And I'll say that uh, those were two of the tremendous selections we had at the last tipping point solicitations. We had 16 of, uh, of those. And it's been enormously successful for us as we're going forward. Uh, we're going to be releasing one just in a few days again, the next announcement for people. And, and, and the regenerative fuel cell activity that you talked about is, is very exciting work that, that uh, we're seeing done there. And they're doing a great job. Uh, what I would say is, is you know, a big part of us is, is continued support that we be a, a cross-cutting, uh, technolo transformative technologies that we develop and not be too constrained on, on, on specific activities that, that might be the best, you know, in, individually might be a really high priority, but, but not be too constraining. What we find from our industry partners with Tipping Point is they want a pretty broad trade space. We, 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 we address them with or ask them to have general areas of, of of expertise, uh, such as lunar surface technology development or something like that, but beyond that, we give them pretty much freedom to do so. And so having that freedom on our side and, and sanctioning and uh, uh, appreciating it, you know, of, of what we do there is, is one of the best things we could see. Thank you. I'm, I'm really uh, gratified and glad to hear about the continued and possibly expanded support for those companies and others doing like work. and enormously important work and fuel cells in particular. I will also tell you that they described to me their challenges because of the supply chain bottlenecks mm -hmm. involving semiconductors. And, uh, you know, our space program, like American industry in every sector, may be constrained by these supply chain bottlenecks. And I'm wondering if you have recommendations to us about what we can and should do. And, and some of my other colleagues may, uh, may have uh, better insight as well. What I would say is that is universal across, our, across all our projects. And I, everybody here will be nodding. That is a major issue that we have here. And, and what we see then is, is that it, it greatly cripples what we can do, you know, because what it does is leads towards cost growth. It leads towards towards delays and schedules and stuff. And, and for us, that means there's content we can't do as a result of this. It is a national problem that needs some national address as, as we go through this. The semiconductor industry, there's only one of those, but that's one of the really critical ones. I, I will just use your word, uh, potentially crippling delays are the result of these kinds of supply chain bottlenecks. And I see heads nodding. Uh, my time is expired, but I think that uh, all of you would agree that these kinds of supply chain bottlenecks are an extraordinary challenge indeed, potentially crippling to our space yes. program as they are to so many others. Yes. And the record will note that 
there is agreement in. <laughs> the head's nodding. <laughs> Thank you. If, if you had another question, well, I'm going to uh, take executive privilege and start a second round of questions. If that, I hope you guys don't have any early coffee dates you're missing or anything. Do uh, you want to add another question? I have one Steve more. I, I have one might. more quick question because I'm going to have to run, and it's not so much a question as a comment. Um, I just finished a book, which uh, a number of you may have read without even knowing about this hearing. I started the book. It's called. Um, Invisible Figures um, about the African-American um, women who were involved as computers. They called themselves computers, uh, who worked during World War II to uh, invent and um, refine airplane wings, engines, using wind tunnels, but they did the calculations, African-American women who have been invisible. Um, and without going through the whole book, of course, they continued through the NASA program, putting a man on the moon with no credit then, fortunately, maybe now more as a result of the book and the movie. Uh, but it emphasized to me the importance of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, and we all know that talent is not limited to one race, religion, ethnic background, you know, to say the obvious. But um, I'm just wonder wondering if um, any of you have comments about what kinds of investments we should be making to make your workforces more inclusive and diverse or to put it differently, to make sure we have the best and the brightest, the, the best talent, the smartest, most able people, uh, who right now may be unfortunately invisible, whether it's in high school or um, other levels of education. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to comment on that, just because uh, I, I'm sure I speak for all of us who have built teams, you know, the innovative potential and the excellence of a team strongly relates to the diversity in that team and the ability of having multiple viewpoints and backgrounds uh, coming to bear. And, you know, that book and film, you know, that, that was made off it. It's just, they're just amazing examples of that. Uh, for us, uh, you know, what that means is uh, really asking the questions, where are the, the pockets of people that are not currently finding on-ramps into our program? Some of them are in... Uh, you know, minority-serving uh, institutions. Some of them are at communi community colleges, uh, and and it's really important to us. I mean, I always like if you've actually built space hardware, you realize there's going to be the the few weeks you're going to stand next to the person who is was educated in a community college, and your entire mission depends on whether they're doing a great job. And so for us, I think it's it's a constant effort, and it will require. Uh, and we've um, in our budget proposal have, uh, uh, that's uh, under consideration here, on ramps uh, from such uh, uh, organizations that they really can become uh, part of us uh, and, and, and the ecosystem that I think requires that we use all the talent that we have in our country. Well, thank you for your testimony and um, thank you for being so forthright and candid. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Senator. And I'm going to now pause the second round of questions because we have the first round of questions from Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to each of the witnesses. I want to start this afternoon with the International Space Station. Uh, it's no secret to any of you uh, that I have long worked to extend the life of the ISS uh, through at least 2030. American leadership in space is in no small part due to the ISS, and it's imperative that we utilize every bit of the $100 billion that we've invested before decommissioning and deorbiting the station. Along that point, NASA recently released its updated International Space Station Transition Report. As part of that, NASA has a, quote, projected savings from transmission to commercial low Earth orbit destinations of roughly $1.3 billion starting in 2031, ramping up to $1.8 billion in 2033. 
Um, I don't know which of you wants to take this, maybe you, Mr. Free. Uh, but have the appropriators told, actually told NASA that this money, these anticipated savings, will still be appropriated to NASA for other exploration programs? It, it seems like NASA is assuming that. Sir, thank you for the question. I think, as you know, the, the space station falls under our space operations mission directorate led by Kathy Leaders. And I think what I'd like to do is take that question for the record to allow Kathy and her team to answer it. Well, we'll certainly welcome follow-up in writing, but I will say there seems to be an assumption that NASA will be able to do all the research and prove out all the exploration technologies on, on these CLD platforms that they would have done on the ISS, but at least initially, these platforms are going to be smaller than the ISS and less capable. Uh, what is the comparison of how many NASA astronauts we're able to have on station every year now versus what NASA anticipates being able to do when CLD platforms have replaced ISS? And how will that impact the research and technology demonstrations NASA is able to do? Thank you for the question, sir. I think um, the, the specific numbers I'll have Kathy answer. I think what I'd like to highlight, though, for you is we plan on continuing to use the, the, the assets in the future as we do ISS today. Things like carbon dioxide removal, um, oxygen generation will still be able to, to be done. It will be different volumes, uh, different number of crew, but we still will, will be able to prove out the technologies we need to go on to Mars. But as far as the number of astronauts, I will gladly take that and, and have uh, Ms. Leaders give you that answer. So I understand there's a hope that one of the CLD platforms will also provide transportation as part of its services. But if transportation costs for NASA astronauts aren't provided, and NASA continues to pay the same transportation cost for CLD platforms as ISS, how much does that eat into the, quote, savings that NASA is projecting? Uh, thank you, sir. My mother's going to be very mad for, at me for not answering your questions. I just want you to know that. Uh, I, I, in fairness to, to Kathy and, and the space ops folks, I think um, we'd like to take that and, and give you that answer um, because I think that that's best coming from, from them. So I will welcome that answer in writing. My understanding is it would be about $1.8 a year if the same number of missions are kept. Um, let's, let's move on. The report also talks about as a goal through 2030 to maintain strong U.S. leadership in low Earth orbit, noting that the U.S., quote, continues to set norms and standards for space operations, including debris mitigation, space situational awareness, interoperability standards, et cetera. What has the reaction been from our international partners about transitioning to a CLD platform? Are they excited to move from a U.S. government capability to a private model where they buy time and space? I think uh, uh, a lot of those discussions are still ongoing. Their commitment to space station has been strong and, and our other parts of our exploration have been strong as well. Um, I think the discussions about how they transition to uh, those future commercial LEO destinations are still ongoing, but I'll add that to the list to have Kathy come back with a specific by country. And, and, and listen, I'm, I am very supportive of the growing commercial space sector. I think it has tremendous potential. I've long said that I think the first trillionaire will be made in space. But the ISS isn't just a, a big science experiment in space. It also is a strategic national security asset in the way the United States projects power around the world, quite literally. And I'm a little concerned that a private platform we just buy space on doesn't have quite the same force. When China starts saber rattling in the South China Sea, we don't put Navy sailors on a Carnival cruise ship and send it to Asia. We send the real Navy. Has any consideration been given to the geostrategic impact this will have, that is, at a time when China is putting up a brand new station, what message does scuttling our own government asset instead of, and instead just leasing space, what message does that send to our allies and to our adversaries? I, I think our uh, preeminence of space will continue uh, built off of what we have on station today, continuing the experiments by our commercial partners, because they are partners with us as government. And our uh, exploration, I think, 
uh, continues to, to lead the world, and that includes going on to the moon. So I think uh, we, our partnerships will remain strong and our leadership will still be there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With pleasure. All right, I'm gonna resume my interrogation. Um, before, Ms. Fred, I just wanna point out when you said, talked earlier, you said that your first priority was to make sure you don't get in the way of Artemis I. I thought it was vaguely reminiscent of, of the Hippoc Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm, which I think is for all of you when you're moving into these new roles so frequently is to make sure that you don't upset all the progress investments that are made, somewhat akin to what Senator Cruz was talking about. Um, Dr. Pace, uh, while you were executive secretary of the National Space Council, NASA completed a, a, a plan for the for commercial uh, LEO development. What's your reaction to the administration's decision to extend the operation of the ISS to 2030 and NASA's deorbit plan for ISS as described in their uh, recent transition report? Okay. Thank you. Um, with regard to the, uh, the ISS transition, this is actually something we started talking about very soon uh, when, when I arrived there. Uh, because we knew that the hardware was aging. We didn't know how long it was gonna last, but we knew it wasn't gonna last forever. And so while we, we understand and support the extension through 2030, we also understand the hardware is gonna get a vote. And in the, time, in the timelines that aerospace projects take, uh, it is not too soon to be doing what we're doing now. We wanted to push uh, commercial LEO developments as fast as we possibly could. We put that in the president's budget requests. Uh, I'm gratified the support we're now seeing from the Congress and the plans that NASA is putting out there because we need to be prepared. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully the station will go through 2030, but it's possible it won't. And so having these programs in place now for both commercial, uh, NASA, and our international partners, I think is vitally important. I would agree with Senator Cruz that uh, the station is a security asset, a part of larger you know, US diplomacy. I would argue that the Artemis program is an even bigger asset. Uh, the Gateway program out uh, around the moon has got all of our major partners on it except Russia. And uh, they, the Russians have said that they don't intend to participate. Uh, and uh, we will have our international partners other than Russia with us on the moon, around the moon. We will hopefully be on the moon. We will not only be in low earth orbit with commercial uh, partners showing the strength and power of US industry, but we and our international partners will be on an even bigger stage. And so I think he's quite correct that uh, the station is important for shaping norms of behavior, but the Artemis program is an even bigger stage for that. And we're operating not just in low Earth orbit now, but now we're operating across all of cislunar space, which is increasingly a strategic asset for the United States. Uh, so I think we're, we, we need to be moving now and we need to be moving even faster than we are. And your reaction to the deorbit plan? I'm glad, uh, I'm glad this one's there. Uh, when during the uh, Constellation program, actually, we showed uh, station ending around 2015, uh, believe it or not, uh, and uh, because we thought that decision should be made maybe by a future administration, uh, we did not have a, a clear uh, deorbit plan and were appropriately criticized for that. So the fact that NASA is putting that plan together now as part of the transition, uh, has budget estimates for it, uh, and is gonna be thinking about planning, uh, I think is commendable. Uh, that's what they should have on the shelf. Now, they may need to use it sooner rather than later, but the fact that they have it and are gonna to continue to refine it uh, is very important. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Zerbuchen, uh climate change, arguably the, the greatest threat to our planet. Uh, NASA recently announced the Earth System Observatory Project uh, this is a transformative project to observe the atmosphere, the oceans, the Earth's surface, uh, subsurface using these new satellites, five new satellites. Um, and we will get a th really, I think, an unprecedented 3D view of the planet. Uh, and it's going to allow science a better perspective, I think. And, and I think it might even change our, our approach in addressing climate change. Um, so. Would you describe or talk about a little bit uh, NASA's acquisition and management plan in terms of the uh, Earth System Observ Observatory project? I uh, really uh, agree with you on the importance of this uh, new asset, uh, really a system of systems uh, observing our own 
uh, planet, which uh, itself is highly complex and interconnected. Um, what we're doing right now is, is, frankly, working precisely on that. We've already talked to the community overall that uh, we intend to buy all uh, spacecraft uh, that are that are out there. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, in the commercial, uh, in the comer uh, commercially, so we will not uh, build them ourselves. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we will also compete uh, the ma majority of instruments uh, with uh, commercial industry. We know that uh, from work that has happened in our past uh, with NASA, but also with other agencies, that there's tremendous capabilities out there. Uh, I would not, uh, we, we fully expect in the next uh, few months to actually make moves towards that. Before I do so, and before we really uh, nail that down, uh, I, I, I will follow the advice that came from our large mission study and run an independent review on that entire architecture, because also there we want to understand what the implicit assumptions are in the system. Uh, we'll do that in parallel as we, uh, as we come forward with it. But those are the goals and uh, the plans ahead. Great, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Russell, thanks for discussing the, the GAO's report on the uh, major space telescope telegraph <laughs> tele telescope program. Um, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from these previous space telescope programs um, that should be applied to other NASA programs? No, absolutely. Opinion? Thank you for the question. I, I think uh, James Webb is a, a great example. Um, it's going to deliver tremendous science, but the journey to, to get on station was uh, one that was beset with challenges. Um, so there are lots of good lessons there around having um, very realistic cost and schedule baselines um, when the programs are going through development, having adequate cost and schedule margins, um, because these are one-of-a-kind systems. They're going to be technology challenges that emerge, design challenges, so having the resources to deal with those. Um, those would be a couple of the things to highlight. And I think NASA is going to have a number of opportunities to demonstrate what they've learned. They've put in some new programmatic tools and other methods in their acquisition process that can help uh, position some of the new programs like the SLS Block 1B and some of the key systems needed for Artemis uh, to be successful if they can follow some of the good practices that they put in place. Great. Um, and I've got a couple more questions, but I think you guys are all busy. I don't want to detain you longer than, than necessary. Uh, so I think we can draw this to a close. I got notice that the, um, the chair is not, Chair Campbell is not going to be able to get, get back here. And Ranking Member Lummis, my co-leader co here, is also not going to be able to get back. So this hearing will remain open until Wednesday, February 23rd. Um, and any of the other senators, I know there were several that were trying to get here, uh, but they uh, who would like to submit questions to the record for witnesses will need to do so by Wednesday, February 23rd. Um, for all of you, um, we ask that your responses be returned to the, the committee by Wednesday, March 9th. Um, I want to thank each of you for taking the time out, and, and I thought as I looked at the scope of all of you today, what you've done in space and done for, well, for our country and for the world is really remarkable. I'm not sure I've ever seen, it reminds me a little bit of what is the 19, was it the 1927 Yankees they called the Murderer's Row? I can't remember which year it was, but um, anyway, we really appreciate your time and willingness and, and your commitment to, to space.